This is The Jason Jones Show, powered by Mudhouse Media. Now, here's Jason Jones. Aloha, everybody, and welcome to The Jason Jones Show. I am your host, Jason Jones. Now, I have a show for you today. I have said repeatedly, so you know it's true, I founded this podcast One of the main reasons I founded this podcast was to share with the world the beautiful people I have the privilege to meet. And number one on the list of beautiful people I've had the privilege to meet is my guest on the show today. And our guest is Mother Olga. She is the founder of the Daughters of Mary of Nazareth. She is from Iraq. She's ethnically Armenian and Assyrian. So the Assyrians are like the first Christians since the first century. And Armenia was the first Christian nation. So those are some deep roots. And she is journeying with her sisters from Quincy, Massachusetts to La Crosse, Wisconsin, starting tomorrow. There'll be three days of prayer and fasting for this nation. We're going to talk to Mother Olga about the what makes America special. What principles should we uh, be looking to when we vote? And she closes us off in prayer, which is her, in her native language, Aramaic, which is the language that Jesus himself spoke. So she closes us out in prayer in Aramaic. So you're going to want to listen to the very end. Okay? Also, give us, I, don't, I never ask this. You don't get unless you ask. So I'm going to ask for two things today. Five stars. Give us five stars and write a nice review Those reviews make this show grow. And this show has been growing all over the world, thanks to you. But when you write a review and when you give us five stars, the way the algorithm works, more people see it. So do that for us. And also, this show is being brought to you by Movie to Movement, creating a culture of life, love, and beauty through the power of film. So go to our website, movietomovement.com, and watch our new movie, Divided Hearts of America, starring Benjamin Watson. This film from the Drudge Report, Hollywood Reporter, Newsweek, it's making some noise. Check out what all the noise is about. about. And when you're at movietomovement.com, please make a small donation. Uh, I am spending money faster than we're raising it right now because now is the time, this is the time to promote the incomparable dignity and beauty of the human person. Now is the time to work to advance the interest of the vulnerable from the child in the womb to the Uyghur in concentration camps in East Turkestan. And that's what we've been doing. So make a donation. Join us in solidarity with the most vulnerable people in the world. But now for my interview with the wonderful, beautiful Mother Olga. It's the Jason Jones Show. Aloha, Mother Olga. Welcome to the Jason Jones Show. Hello, Jason. Thank you so much for having me. So first of all, I don't get nervous when I do interviews. I interview heads of state and I don't get nervous, but I'm interviewing you and I'm nervous. I'm nervous. I don't think so, Jason. I'm nervous, Mother Olga. I am. I'm nervous. I, you know, because you're someone I admire so much and... Um, I'm so grateful for the work you're doing, and I had the privilege of, of meeting you in person and speaking for you in an event, which was one of the greatest honors of my life. So it's good to have you on the show. Thank you, Jason. It was really a blessing having you here with us in Boston, and you touched many lives, including mine. So uh, I'm inspired by you and all that you do, you and your family. So thank you for your work. Well, you, you're so kind. You know, our the... the the apostolate or sort of the mission of this show is to advance the interest of the vulnerable. And I always say it's from the child in the womb to the Yazidi girl on Mount Sinjar. And so you as an Assyrian Christian is a Catholic and the founder of uh, a religious order. You, your apostolate and, 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 and the apostolate of this show, I think are very similar, right? I mean, your heart is for the vulnerable, you know, firsthand, uh, the cost of uh, when we fail to organize our society around protecting the vulnerable. 
Absolutely, Jason. I agree with you. We do have, you know, a common mission, and that's really to protect and honor every human person, and especially those who are most vulnerable among us, truly. So that's why... Like for me, personally... Yeah, uh, go ahead. No, I'm sorry, Mother. Continue. You know, I was just thinking, like, two days ago, um, I was serving at the shelter. As you know, here we have a, a shelter for pregnant mothers, single mothers, um, with their babies, they come throughout their pregnancy and they can stay until the baby is born and then they can stay one full year until the baby turns one year old. Um, so in the morning I had ministry with them and, you know, serving the mom and teaching them classes and make sure that, you know, their life is in the proper order to secure what they need for the future after they leave the shelter. And then a few hours later I came home and I was working with some young people who are really battling um, severe depression and anxiety, especially with all what happened with COVID and the schools and there's so much pressure on these teenagers. And then a few hours later, I was working with people with addiction uh, and how much, you know, addiction has really impacted their lives and the lives of their loved ones. And then my, my day ended visiting a hospice home uh, for a 39 years old woman who can go to meet the Lord at any time um, on this day. So it's just, I came home and the sisters were asking me about my day. And I said, you know, truly my, my mission is really to honor the dignity of the, every human person from the womb to the tomb, you know, like the, because these are the vulnerable times in people's life, um, whether the, the, the vulnerable child, the, the unborn child, and then these single mothers or the, the teenagers who are so lost in, in our lost society, really. Um, and then those who are suffering from addiction and then those who are at the end of their life in, in hospice home or under hospice care. So it's such a privilege for me. Like in one day, I walk with people of all the different walks of life, stages of life, but the mission is only one same focus, and that is to honor the dignity of every human person especially those most vulnerable among us. You know, the name of your community is the Daughters of Mary of Nazareth. And so like your mother, you know, to me, the, the best work of art that symbolizes our, our duty to solidarity is the Pieta, because there you have Our Lady with her son draped across her lap, her grown son. Um, Amen, yes. And solidarity with the vulnerable isn't solidarity with the weak. So often the people we're serving are smarter than us, stronger than us, more virtuous than us, harder working than us. They've just been placed in impossible situations. And that's why we have this sort of responsibility, just like Mary was a creature and her creator was draped across her lap. It's unbelievable to think about, right? And, yes, um, and we think sometimes we have to travel to the ends of the earth to find the vulnerable but somebody battling depression, they could be the wealthiest man in town and they're battling severe depression. That, that guy is the most vulnerable man in your town or the teenage mother who is a great athlete and the most popular girl in her class, but all of a sudden from a good family, but all of a sudden she has found herself in the, the, this impossible situation or the, the brightest, he's the brightest young man, but born into poverty or abuse and he's addled with all of these problems. The most vulnerable; these are among the most vulnerable people in the world. Uh, but they're har it's harder to see, isn't it? It's harder to have empathy or understand because that we we're, we're surrounded by it. Yeah, you know, a couple of things, Jason. You just mentioned so beautifully about the word solidarity. Solidarity, really, as you said, it's not. It it, it means literally to be one with people. But what is beautiful about the word solidarity, it's not something, as you said, only we go and give to people, but they enrich our lives too, you know, because we become one with them. It's not like we are on one level and they are on the lower level and we are the one who have resources and give them and care for them or give them voice. No, it's, it's mutual. Like, that's the beauty of solidarity when we become one with them. And it's so, um, a Christian theme, the theme of solidarity, because God himself came to be one with us. That's what we believe in the incarnation. He came to be one with us. So when we carry his love to other people and we become 
one with them in their in their suffering, in their vulnerable times. It's really like living Jesus incarnation on earth, becoming one with people. And you know, the other thing as you said, with all these circumstances, you know, people when I talk with people who suffer from addiction, I tell them I've seen whether people are from jail or yell. Unfortunately, sometimes, you know, go through this very dark valley of being lost and, and suffer so much because of addiction. So, you know, the places we serve, the people that we meet, they enrich our life. And it's not, you know, their circumstances are not in any way a reflection of who they are, where they came from, or why they end up where they are. Yeah, I mean, we're seeing it played out on the world stage right now with the tragedy that is Hunter Biden. And I had this strange thought yesterday when I was driving in my car. Wouldn't it be beautiful to see Hunter Biden have a reversion and a return to his faith and uh, become an example of holiness? And um, yeah. it is it is just really heartbreaking. And, and sometimes yeah. in a contested uh, political environment, when someone's not on the same page as you, it you know, it's uh, it may be hard to have empathy or it's easier to condemn someone. But the reality is, like you said, from jail to Yale and from in all families, we have people who struggle with addiction and it's, yeah. it's heartbreaking. Yeah. And I agree with you. For me, you know, I pray a lot for government leaders and uh, all those who have, you know, role to play in really changing the society to really have change of heart and have genuine conversion because, Every word they say, every decision they make, it impacts life and not only at the present moment. And sometimes, unfortunately, it might, if we don't choose the right way and if we don't do the right thing, you know, it might take us generations to recover from the choices we might make today. That's true. Now, speaking of praying for our political leaders and praying for our countries, I've been wanting to have you on for so long. But the reason I wanted you on this week was because in a very specific way, you're going to be praying not only for our political leaders, but praying for our country. And what I, I love about you so much, Mother Olga, is you're a new immigrant. You're not from Anglo culture. You're an Assyrian from the Christian Holy Land, really, of Iraq. And But you talk about this country like my grandmother, who was descended from someone on the Mayflower. You know this is your country. This is all of our country. And you gave me a, a great prayer that I have on my wall, the, the first prayer of the first Congress, and it was written by John Adams. And you live in Quincy, yeah. Massachusetts, which the John Quincy Adams and John Adams, John Adams to me was the most beautiful of our founding fathers. You love this country, and you speak about this country more beautifully than I have heard anyone talk about our country. Absolutely. Um, Jason, when I first determined to become a citizen, I didn't have to. It was not like I didn't have a place to go or I couldn't go back to my country or, you know, I wanted to live and, um, you know, benefit from all the resources of the citizens of our country. Received. It was really a, a deep discernment for me. Um, you know, I, I remember at that time I told Tadi and Sean, I was serving at Boston University and I became like a spiritual mother to a lot of students from across the country. They used to come to me with all their questions, needs, and joyous moments, saddest moments. And um, when I discerned to become citizen, and I shared that with Cardinal Sean, and, you know, some countries allow dual citizens, some they don't. So I knew that by becoming American citizen, I won't be able to, you know, keep my, um, you know, citizenship to the, the country of my birth in Iraq. But I told Karin Sean, even though it was a difficult discernment for me to make, but I said, God has led me here, and God has blessed me with many spiritual children who call me mother, and it's time for their mother to be one with them. And even after I made that decision, it took me a long time to really, I wanted to study American history. I went to all the places where our um, kind of foundational places for, for our nation. I went to the places of all the, where American saints and blessed lived because I wanted to study their history, like Mother Cabrini, Mother Elizabeth Ann Seaton. Uh, I went to learn more about the, the Mayflower and the uh, Plymouth Rock and just so many different states. Uh, 
I went to Washington, I went to Pennsylvania. I really wanted to not only to take the name of this country upon my heart, but I wanted to take people of this country in my heart. So I did a lot of studies. Sometimes sisters say, you should have majored in the history of the United States. But I, I did it. You know, when you love people, Jason, when you have somebody you love, you want to know everything about them. And I truly, God blessed me with deep and profound love for our nation. And I wanted to know everything about them before I took the oath and hold that precious flag in my hand the day that I became citizen. I think that's so beautiful. And now you are, you're an American. You know, I the way you feel about the United States, I, I of course, feel about my own country, but I, I do feel the same way uh, about Iraq. And a friend of mine who calls himself a Sushi Muslim because his father was Sunni, his mother was Shia, and he was raised in Kurdistan, and he's a good friend of Christians. When he came here, he told me he never felt more, he, more at home anywhere in the world. In fact, they felt more at home after a couple of days in the United States than he felt in some neighborhoods in Iraq, in some parts of Iraq. And I think that is something that's beautiful. And I think sometimes when people emigrate here, they don't, you know, understand you're, you're home. This is your home. But you understand yeah. that. You knew that. I mean, you, you talk about this country with a familiarity that's so beautiful. And you, I think you do. You are... Um, You've come to really understand and admire the, the Adams family as well, right? Living in Quincy. Yeah. Yeah, I visited the, the tombs of our two presidents who are buried here in Quincy. I visited their homes. But again, the first thing I did when I was looking for a convent for our community, and I found that there was a possibility for us to come to Quincy, I did the same. I wanted to know the history of the city. I wanted to know the people of the city. Um, and as soon as we moved, I never met that mayor before or, you know, knew anything about him. I reached out to him. I reached out to the police department, the fire department, um, just to let them know we are now as a religious order in their city that we will be praying and interceding for them. Um, that is, again, you know, going back to what two of us believe based in the, the importance of solidarity. And that means to be one with people, to be one with people that we you know, called to serve and to be with them. So I really don't feel myself. Sometimes I've been living in Quincy only for four years. I feel like I've been born here just because I, I, I see everybody as my family. Well, and, and that's why I care. Yeah, go ahead. Well, no, and your mayor there is so wonderful. And to think that you kind of live in, you know, where uh, the, some of those first settlers came and to think that from the beginning, Catholics and Protestants were working together when, Squanto, the only Catholic on the Eastern Seaboard, happened to bump into the Puritans and um, taught them how to farm and, and save their lives. Save their lives, really. Yes, and that's what for me, Jason, you pointed earlier. Like I do, um, you know, take the things in our country very seriously and to heart because, you know, I I don't live just for my own time. Now I often tell people. Um, you know, I do it for your children, your great children, your great great children, your future, the future generation of this country. Um, I remember even in 2003 um, when we had the, the second Gulf War in Iraq, and I was at that time talking a lot about peace and trying to prevent that decision to happen. And and even after it did happen on March 19, 2003, I continued to talk about peace and. And at one of the universities where I was teaching, somebody asked me the question. They said, you were doing this before March to stop the war, but no, the war already happened. When are you going to stop? And I said, I don't think I will stop because it's not about seeing it in my own lifetime. I will continue to speak about peace. Hopefully the future generations will have the peace that I didn't grow up with. And same thing now with all the challenges in our country. You know, people are asking me, what are all the things that you are fighting for, you know, now, you know, to honor and, and, and protect the most vulnerable among us, like the unborn and the sanctity of life, the sanctity of marriage, and all the things you are fighting for now for this country. What if, if all that changes, you know, if, if we get, you know, a leader who might not respect these views and these principles, you know, 
when you just stop and you feel like you, you did your best and that's it. And I said, no, I will, I will continue to do my part regardless who is the leader of this country because I love my people and I want the future of this nation to be what God intended for this land to be when our forefathers built this nation under his name, one nation under God. And I will continue to do that until the last breath regardless who will be the leader, because I want my people to have what God intended for humanity to have. Do you, you know, our founding fathers always wrote for us and for our posterity in every document, and they were the grandchildren of, uh, their, their grandparents lived through the glorious revolution in England, and so they knew the cost of chaos and war and what happens when we deny rights. But I think we've forgotten that as Americans. Do you think growing up, in Iraq with such a, I mean, the church that you probably went to as a young child, what year was that church built? Yeah. Do you remember? Oh, yeah, from what we believe in Iraq, that the first Assyrian church was built in 67 after Jesus by St. Thomas the Apostle. That's what we believe growing up. And, and we still have the room of that church in South of Baghdad. And so you can see that. So do you think growing up there, it gives you a real understanding that our actions impact people for not only hundreds of years, but for millennia? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I've seen all the persecutions and genocides that happened, you know, in, in, in Middle East. And, you know, even as a child, I, so I'm a child of an Assyrian father and an Armenian mother. And both the Armenians had genocide, the Assyrians had genocide. And as a child, even though I wasn't born when that happened to the Armenian people and the Assyrian people, but being born to an Armenian mother and an Assyrian father, you know, I, I saw the pain and the suffering that their ancestors went through. And it was passed on to me, you know, thinking of the suffering of the Armenian people and the Assyrian people. So it does, it does impact the good and the bad. It does impact us sometimes you know, for generations to come, even those who might not live in what we are living now. That's why our our thoughts, our principles, our actions, our votes are so important now, because it's not about just what we want to see the coming four years. Yeah, and the, and the consequences, the Assyrians had to suffer through another genocide in your lifetime that you saw coming and tried to stop. And the Armenians now... Yes. Um, in Azerbaijan and Turkey, it looks to be like, you know, it's, it's tensions have relaxed in the past yes. couple of days, but it, it, it's, it's frightening again. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So now you're going on a pilgrimage uh, and you're going to have three days of, of prayer and fasting and penance and all, yes. at, at the National Shrine of Our Lady of Guadalupe in La Crosse, Wisconsin. And why, why? the Shrine of Our Lady of Guadalupe and La Crosse, and why three days? And so what are you praying and fasting for? So one of the things we see in my prayer for our country, you know, I see the devastation that we have been experiencing, especially in this year, 2020, for a lot of reasons. Obviously, COVID is number one, but also all the, you know, political tensions and, um, you know, all the challenges that we have seen, the unrest, the violence, and approaching the election. Um, you know, you and I and many other people and from even, you know, on higher level of gifts and talents and resources, we all want to do the right thing for our country. But at the end of the day, Jason, you are a man of faith and you understand that like, there is so much we can do. It has to be first and foremost the power of God. Yes. And that is why my prayer and my work and all the things that I've been trying to do to help our people, especially during this year of 2020, um, you know, I, as I said, I talk a lot, I write a lot, I, you know, share with people, I go to places. Um, you know, maybe a lot of people were quarantined during COVID. I never stopped really, like... Um, in, in some ways, my life became even busier during COVID because I care about the people who were suffering in, in so many different ways. So when I was praying, Lord, what else? What else I can do for my people? What else I can offer for my people? And I feel like 
we are in a battle these and we are in in very very intense time in the history of our country for this generation for the time that we are living in and i just felt like i needed to put everything in the hand of god like truly surrender everything in the hand of god and for me as catholic religious woman you know like i have learned how much mother mary has been always there with her children throughout the history of christianity especially in most troubled times like i remember in fatima in 1917 our lady appeared during the first world war to assure her children that she is right there with them she can pray with them and the peace will come so as i was doing some research as where to go where to meet people uh, for a pilgrimage to trust our country to the lord with the hands of mary i thought of our lady of guadalupe because um i believe it was around 1999 when our um holy father uh, saint pope john paul ii he named our lady of guadalupe patron of americans and i really felt like i wanted to give our country to her through her title our lady of guadalupe but as you know because of covid you know we cannot go to the uh, international shrine in mexico and the more i did research and i found out we do have an actual shrine of our lady of guadalupe it will be right here on our own soil uh, in the cross with something um and i started talking to people and seeing who would be interested to come to this program is to interest all Americans especially this upcoming weekend and the, the week of election to really put everything in the hands of Mary and our lady of guadalupe is also one of our oldest apparitions for for our lady and you know it's almost like for me like a child like trust you know when kids are afraid they run to their mothers and i will be honest with you i have you know a lot of concern in my heart for our country i love this country i love our people and i just want the right thing happen to our people so i'm just it's my way of running to my mother it's my way of running to my holy mother my heavenly mother and give for all the people dear to my heart to her to watch over our nation to watch over our country and to protect us in you know days to come weeks to come months to come and please god generations to come and the motivation for me of the behind this discernment was also the the story of queen esther queen esther seen a time in her life when her people were in in danger to be completely wiped out and she turned to her god god the father god that you and i we believe in and she wrote to her people even to her maids and the people who worked for her as a queen She said we're going to take 3 days of prayer and fasting and believing with confidence that God will deliver us. God will deliver our people from this battle. She gave me that inspiration that I'm not by any means you know a reflection of anything that Queen Esther did, but I have the same zeal and love that she had for her people. and i want to invite people for 3 days of prayer and fasting and offering sacrifice and penance whatever each person can do based on their ability and believing that god will deliver our nation god will deliver us in this battle that we are going through so there are two stories in the bible that really prayer and fasting changed the history of humanity the first one was in the capital of my own Uh, people Nineveh you know when the, in the book of Jonah we read about the fasting of Nineveh three days fasting and praying and offering penance and God delivered the people of Nineveh and same thing in the book of the queen Esther God delivered them because of three days of prayer and fasting and offering so i'm inviting people that are somewhat traveling with us We leave God willing tomorrow morning. It's three days pilgrimage to Our Lady of Guadalupe Shrine in the Cross, Wisconsin. We're gonna pray and fast, offer masses, rosaries, divine mercy chaplets, and whatever each person physical offering can can give on behalf of our nation and on behalf of our people. Now, how can people journey with you or follow your journey you from know, home? If they if they want to go with yeah. you in person, is can they? 
Yeah, so there are people who are, you know, coming with us. We already have our tickets and the pilgrimage is planned and we are following all the, you know, government restrictions. Like, for example, for us in Massachusetts, upon our arrival, we have to present either negative test of COVID or to uh, quarantine for 14 days. So some people who have jobs, they cannot quarantine 14 days. So we have arranged with Mayo Clinic in um, La Crosse. As soon as we arrive tomorrow, we all go to the clinic. We all will get tested so that when we come back home, we will present that we are following the guidelines and, and the restrictions. Um, and same thing, we are working with the team, uh, um, the people at the shrine who are helping us with this pilgrimage. And we are very excited that we're going to meet also Cardinal Burke, who's flying um, to Wisconsin also tomorrow. So we're going to attend Mass with him, and I'm sure it will be offered for, for our country and for our nation. Um, so those of us who are traveling together and others from different states, they can just meet us there. But I understand because of the pandemic, not many people will be able to do it in person. But I want them to believe just like Queen, Queen, Queen Esther, when she wrote to her people, you know, none of them were with her when she was living. But she said, wherever you are, you can pray, you can fast, you can offer. And together, I will be strengthened to do this for our people. And I, I would say the same to all the listeners. Wherever you are, the coming three days, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, uh, please, if you can, pray rosaries for our nation, offer divine mercies. Uh, pray the prayer of St. Michael for the protection of our country. Um, go to Masses, offer your Holy Communion for our country, for the intentions of our country. Uh, in terms of fasting, if people physically can, if they don't have, like, you know, medical conditions, even if, you know, one day you can give up meat, next day you give up dessert, another day you give up coffee or soda, but just the, the intention is not very much about, you know, the the quantity of things that we can do, but it's more about the quality, the quality of our genuine offering, genuine fasting, genuine prayer, genuine really asking God to forgive us for the sins of our nation, especially those committed against the unborn. Um, you know, so I do believe we can do this. You know, through our prayer and fasting, wherever you are, please, as I said, even if one decade rosary, one divine mercy, um, try to make it to adoration. If there are churches open around you, they have adoration. But only through And what are those days? Prayer, those, so those days are tomorrow? Tomorrow, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Okay. And we end our pilgrimage. And we come really very late night, we, almost like um, 12.30 on November 2nd. So we want a three full days pilgrimage, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Now, Mother, you mentioned the pre-born. What, what, when, when we're going to vote, you were not raised in a constitutional republic. You were not raised, you, I mean, you, you grew up under Saddam Hussein. What principles should we be using when we vote, when we have to decide to vote? You know, you know Jason, I've been encouraging people to really focus on principles, not personalities. You know, we are human beings and, you know, none of us is perfect, including myself. Um, you know, some people may like outdoor personality, some like to be introvert, or it depends. You know, we all have our own personalities and the makeup of who we are. So I'm just encouraging people, when you think of a leader of a nation, you shouldn't focus on personality or the person, rather the principle that this person stands for. And, you know, we do need to focus on the pro-life issues. And I know some people may argue, they say, but mother, we cannot be one-issue voters. I agree with you if those one issue was about different subjects that can be changeable. But the pro-life, the protection of the unborn, it's the essential, it's fundamental. It's not just something we can negotiate about it. It's about life. You know, I told some people yesterday, you know, I know maybe a lot of people care about um, the the rights of, you know, good health care, the rights of immigration, the rights of equality, you know, and I understand all these things are important and we need to care about them. But if the right to life is not protected, all other rights will not exist. Right. When That's I've... why we read. 
And I and I find mother the politicians that are wrong about the child in the womb are generally wrong about everything. I mean, if if you look at um, you know the previous administration, I don't want to drag you into political discussion specifically, but I mean, in the previous administration, the Obama administration, of course, Obama was not pro life, and he waged a reckless drone war that killed thousands of children from Pakistan to Yemen, and he built the cages at the southern border. And one of the great criticisms of Trump is the separation of parents from their children. You know, there was such a problem with human sex trafficking of children and not knowing if these were actually the parents, uh, that they're yeah. trying to figure out how to best manage that. And, and again, even at the border, I, I, I care so much about the border as an issue, but my greatest concern is that we have an economy that's resting on the exploitation of millions of migrants trapped in an underground economy. And... Yeah you know, this election so much weighs in the balance and the candidate Mm -hmm. at the top of the ticket and the other candidates that are pro-life are generally right on the other issues I find, or they're closer to what I support as a Catholic. Um, And my, one of my greatest fears with this election is we've had four years without any new wars. In the last administration, we saw Libya turn a fall to ISIS, Africa, a, a, Africans being sold as slaves in the open market. And uh, I would hate to see a return to endless regime change wars. I would hate to see uh, a return to open season and the exploitation of migrants in an underground economy. And I would hate to see the progress that we have made to protecting the preborn child from violence. Uh, But I kind of think that they're all connected, right? Absolutely, thank you, yes. Absolutely, they all connected. But truly, Jason, I tell people like, if you really, you know, you want to make a difference and you want to make a change, the first place we can start again, it has to be protection of the unborn. When I think, Jason, of our country since abortion became legal, we have lost 60 plus million souls. You know, those 60 million, as you know, you know. I'm from a very small country, the, the place of my birth. You know, some countries are 25 million, 30 million. We have lost 60 plus million American children. Could have been a great potential for this country. You know, those 60 plus million babies, we could have had, you know, politicians, doctors, teachers, nurses, of all the different, you know, majors and, and, and careers to make difference in our country and we let go of those 60 million plus potentials and lives if people only stop and think and i said yesterday to some people you know by me being so focused on the pro-life issue in this election i'm not in any way discriminating or judging the women who had abortion i have walked with women who were raped i have walked with women who were forced by their own parents when they were teenagers to take them to the clinic and had abortion. I work with people who suffer from abortion. I'm not judging anybody and I'm not discriminating them when I'm focusing on the importance of life issue for this election. Um, I do believe for a country like our country, we have so many resources. We can help those women who are in crisis as we do here, for example, in Quincy and many other cities and states of our country, there are, you know, places for the single mothers. We, there are places to help them to be healed, be whole. And if they can raise a child on their own, praise God. If not, we help them find adoption. We encourage adoption. We celebrate adoption. So there is so much we can do. I don't want people to think like, oh, mother is just talking about pro-life and that's it just because she believes when you live a life of helping young mothers right you live i what animates my concern mother i want the law to stop lying to young women you know we've had the when the law lies to them about what abortion is uh our media lies to them even some of our religious leaders lie to them let's stop lying our law used to lie about black people it used to say they were uh second class citizens it used to say they weren't even persons that was a lie I am not responsible yeah. for some guy across town who's a bigot, but is living in a constitutional republic, I am responsible for a law that, that tells a lie about my neighbor. 
Segregation lied mm-hmm. about my neighbor. Legal segregation lied about my neighbor. Uh, Roe v. Wade lies about the child in the womb. And well, we need the law to stop lying and, 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 it, and assent to the truth. And the truth is in the Declaration Principle that we are endowed by God with inalienable rights and those rights in, in all, every human person. I always say that we were so blessed to be founded by Puritans that Puritans founded our country on Catholic anthropology. They didn't know that, right? They didn't, the Puritans didn't understand that the vision of the human person that they embedded in the Declaration of Independence was taught to the world by the Catholic Church. Um, but we're so blessed to live in the only country in the world that is explicitly founded on the Christian vision of the human person, a vision taught to the world by the church. And we want the Constitution to do what it was supposed to do, protect that vision. Yeah, it's really beautiful, Jason. I don't know if you had a chance when you were here in Massachusetts to visit Plymouth, uh, and particularly to visit the monument of our forefathers. Um, I think it's one of the largest monuments that we have in our country, and it was, you know, dedicated in the late 1800s. And it's really beautiful to see the main statue on the top of that monument is a figure of a woman called Faith. And with her right arm, she's pointing to heaven, and her left hand, she's holding the Bible. That is what they wanted. That's what they wanted the foundation our forefathers, they wanted the foundation of our nation to be built on faith. And it saddened me that today we have some time to apologize if we speak about religion, to apologize if we speak about pro-life. People think just because I'm Catholic, I'm speaking about, you know, pro-life. It saddened me sometimes, Jason, and I tell the sisters this, we take pride of our democracy, but sometimes even with the you know, the, the, the attack on the religious liberty in our country. Sometimes I feel, you know, we don't have that democracy to really speak what we believe in. That's another concern for me, like where we are heading with the, the lack of respect for our religious freedom. You know, it's it's frightening. I, I call it, this is the Catholic moment. This is our moment to to stand up for religious liberty and free speech and, and uh, defend the other. You know, I, I, this show, more than any community uh, we fight for, we fight for the Uyghur because they're Muslim, they're Turkic, they live on the other, their, other side of the world, but there are three million of them in concentration camps. Their religious freedom, their right to even their life is being robbed from them by a tyranny. And we are blessed. You know, when you think of the founding of this country, Mother, there were the plans of the men who, you know, and women who came here, right? They were Puritans. They were fleeing any sort of, connection to Catholicism. Even the Anglicans were too Catholic for them. They come here and the first person they meet is a first nation person who's native American Squanto. So you have from the very beginning, you have Protestants and Catholics, first nation peoples and immigrants coming together. And so there was what man had a plan for, and there's what God had a plan for. And Mm -hmm. how beautiful this Republic is, how blessed we are and yeah. we need to share this and we need to be stewards and we need to pass this on to our posterity. And we need once again to be that city on a hill to give hope to people around mm-hmm. the world. Because if we're not there as an example for hope, as a political community that can be peaceful and free and prosperous, uh, people in Iraq and East Turkestan, all over the world, where can they look to for hope? Yeah. You know, one time I spoke to a politician who doesn't support pro-life, and I told him, I said, Senator, you took the oath to protect the citizens of your country. You took the oath that you're going to be of service for your people. And I said, the child in the womb, when he or she is born, they say if the child was born in the United States, they are immediately citizens. So I said, from the womb, you have a citizen to care for and to protect. What, what did he say? And I, and I studied biology, and I told him, I said, I can speak with you about scientific facts that the child in the womb is a human person. Just last month, Jason, as you know, I helped a lot of women, and one woman, um, sadly, she miscarried her baby at um, 17 weeks. 
And I was with her every step of the way. I hold that baby for 12 hours in the palm of my hand. And all the doctors and the nurses, they were just shocked. They said they have never seen something like this. And I told them, I said, this baby is a person. I poured holy water on that baby. I prepared a beautiful funeral for that baby, a beautiful burial for that little soul. And I told them, I said, I do that because I do believe, even though the baby was miscarried at age 17 weeks, but he's fully human. And I can tell you, Jason, at the end of the day, as I said, I was there for more than 12 hours, but I held him right after he, he was miscarried. And, you know, I washed his little body. I clothed him with little, you know, pieces of cloth. You know, at the end of the day, it was beautiful to see all the doctors and nurses talking about the baby as he, not a, a person, even if it was, you know, not fully developed and so small. So we have to speak, we have to vote for life, we have to encourage people to see it's not a tissue, it's not an object, it's a person. And when people say there are other issues, yeah, but what issue today compares with the intentional direct killing with taxpayer dollars of the child in the womb up to the moment of birth in the millions? I mean, what issue possibly can compare to that? I mean, uh, will you know, unjust advocacy of strategic nuclear warfare, I guess, or, I mean, not much, right? There's, there are not many issues that we can even comprehend that would be like and commensurate to the intentional direct killing of countless hundreds of thousands of the most vulnerable members of the human family, the child in the womb. I, 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 I'm, I always say there's, there's really only two ways to vote, a preferential option for the vulnerable or a preferential option for yourself. Either you're going in that yeah. voting booth, voting for what you think serves your best interests, or you're voting for the common good with a special thoughtfulness to the vulnerable. Yeah. And there's no one more vulnerable in this country than the child in the womb. And those poor women who are lied to by our courts and by our politicians. And that was what was, that was, what was beautiful about the prayer of Queen Esther. She didn't pray for herself. She was praying for her people. She was willing to offer her life for her people because people said that the king would not listen to you to change the rule that they were going to kill all her people, the people of Israel at that time. But she didn't pray for herself. She prayed for people, for her people that she loved. And that's what I'm encouraging people, as you said, Jason, so beautifully. When you walk on November 3rd to vote, Think of what kind of America you want to leave for your children and grandchildren 50 years from now, 100 years from now. Two things I'm encouraging people to think when it comes to this election. First, for our people, for those we're going to leave behind, what kind of nation you want to leave them with? And second, for ourselves, when the Lord calls me home, what kind of eternity I want to live? What kind of eternity I want to have? If I don't choose now the right thing and to do the right thing, it's not about personality. It's about the principle, how we can make a difference for generations to come. Yeah, choose Christ now if you want to choose him for eternity. If you want, you know, live a life with the vulnerable now if you want to live a life with God for eternity. Yeah. And, and you know what concerns also, Jason, when people are focusing on you know, the president's personality or style. You know, I said, what kind of message we are teaching our children today? Like you have a number of children, Jason. They go to school and they don't like this kid in the class or this other boy in the team or like how we are teaching our children to work with people who have different personalities. Do you see what I mean? What kind or, of Or we allow, have- we allow others to tell us about other people to spin calumny so if the powerful the most influential are allowed to lie shamelessly or even tell the truth and out of a desire for detraction god forbid anyone tell the whole truth about me anywhere anytime right i mean 
if I, and especially for those who have lived a life in the public eye, uh, and we know about every move they've made since they were boys until adults, there's going to be a lot of stuff that you can say about somebody. We don't want our mm-hmm. biggest mistakes that we have made in private because we're private persons. Uh, if we were public persons, those mistakes would have been known. You know, the mistakes I made as a teenager in my early 20s, if I had been a prominent person or from a prominent family, would have been known. And I wouldn't want that thrown in my face every step of the way for the rest of my life. And so this politics of calumny, the politics of detraction, it's it's no. And that's used, I think, because they they want to, they don't want a politics of principle. They don't want us to be focused on principle. They don't want us to be focused on the vulnerable. So they 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 kick up all this tabloid garbage and try to get us to focus on that and they inundate us with that. Um but instead yeah, when I go to vote, I pray by the grace of God that I am voting in a way that serves the most vulnerable, and I'm voting in a way that leaves the blessings of liberty to my posterity that I have had. And, you know, my grandfather fought mm-hmm. in World War II. My dad was an infantryman. I was an infantryman. My brother and son fought in Iraq, and my brother fought in Iraq. I mean, son fought in Iraq and Syria. My family uh, and so many Americans have have made the ultimate sacrifice to leave us, we, we are the most prosperous Christians in the history of the world, the most privileged Christians yeah. in the history of the world. And we run around every day talking about how wronged we are and how underprivileged we are. Yeah. It's, it's, it's really quite absurd. Mother, yeah, thanks, Houston. Mother so before yeah. we go, and I, I, I promise you it only take up 45 minutes of your time, you're going to be praying for this country uh, and fasting for this country, and um, it was it was Fatima, you know this pr- through prayer and penance. Was this uh, your inspiration yes. for? So in Fatima, yep, in Fatima, our lady told even the three children, the shepherds of Fatima, to pray, fast, and offer penance, and the war will end. And I feel we are in raging war these days. You know, not literally. I don't mean like you know, war zone battle, but it's a different battle and a different war. So we really have to be uh, people of prayer and fasting and, and offering penance, you know, to really save our nation. Um, I remember one of the, uh, I would like to, if, it, if I might, close with these two quotes. One was from St. John Paul II, speaking to Catholic Americans. He says, Catholic of America, always be guided by truth. And that's what I want to invite our listeners, especially those of you who are. Can Catholic. you say that again, again, Mother? I think you turned away to read it, and we did not hear it. Yes. I said one of the quotes from Saint John Paul II, speaking to Americans. He said, "Catholics of America always be guided by truth," and that's one of the things I am encouraging our, you know, Catholic communities. Please seek the truth, learn the truth, follow the truth, and really vote for the truth of this nation and the future of this nation. Catholics of America always be guided by truth. That's really so important for for us um, to remember. And I think St. John Paul the Great understood that there was uh, a constant effort to confuse us and and hide the truth from us so that that the truth is, is has to be sought after that what's often presented to us on a silver platter is a lie. And so we have to to be thoughtful and tenacious and out of love pursue the truth. Yeah, because really, Jason, unfortunately, we live in a time, it's too short. Like we have the social media, which is a great tool for evangelization, for, you know, preaching and speaking the truth and Especially during the pandemic, it was very helpful for people to stay in touch and Zoom and FaceTime. But at the same time, I feel it's the, the two-edged sword of this, you know, um, issue. Sometimes it can be really used to change people's minds and, and thoughts on a lot of things, not in a healthy way. And that's when we need the discernment of spirit as Catholic people when the Pope said, always be guided by truth. We have to really have discernment of spirit and filter what we read filter what we see, filter what people tell us to make sure that we really, really follow the truth. 
Yeah, protect our moral imagination so we can recognize the truth when we see it. Absolutely. The truth of our nation, the truth of the history of our nation, the truth of the, the gift of life that can really enhance and enlarge this nation. You know, I was telling somebody the other day, what would happen to America 50 years from now or 150 years from now when we won't have babies anymore? Like how families will grow? How are we going to have more future citizen generations? Even though, thanks to God, yes, our country is open to welcome many immigrants who come to this country seeking, you know, rights and resources. But it's still the people who live here. If you no longer have babies, you no longer support life. What would happen to America 100 years from now? So really, I cannot emphasize, Jason, to the listeners how crucial this election is. Whatever we do, we're going to read. And please, God, we're going to show peace of truth, peace of life, and peace of hope. The, the last thing I want to share, Jason, is from Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI when he came to the United States in 2008. And I would quote him from um, his, his message to Americans. He said, Americans have always been a people of hope. Your ancestors came to this country with the expectations of finding new freedom and opportunity. While the vastness of unexplored wilderness inspired in them the hope of being able to start completely anew, building a new nation, a new foundation. Hope, hope for the future is very much part of American character. I pray that people of this nation will have hope. Don't give up on, you know, things that you wish could have changed, but they didn't. Now is the time. Today is the time. November 3rd is the time. Let us carry this identity that Pope Benedict so in us as Americans, people of hope. Let's carry that and hope for life hope for peace in this nation when we make the right choices to be guided by truth and truth alone. That's beautiful. You said in a recent talk that voting is an expression of gratitude. And now you're saying voting is an expression of hope. When we vote, it means we are hopeful as we should. St. Maximilian Colby had hope in the bottom of a starvation bunker in Auschwitz. How much more should we have hope with our latte in our hand as we drive up to the polling place? Um, Amen. And so hope is, a voting is an expression of hope. That, I love that. And, and it's also expression of thankfulness to our, it's a thoughtfulness to our posterity and it's showing gratitude to our ancestors. Yes. Mother, one last thing. Yes, yes. Oh, I was going to, um, I would love to hear your last thing. And then I was going to also ask if you can pray for us and maybe even if you could pray for us. So many of us have never heard a prayer in the language that our Lord spoke. Could you pray for us in English and then maybe share a prayer in Aramaic? Yes, absolutely, I want. The last thing I wanted to say, Jason, for you know, your listeners, I don't want them to think like for me by discerning to choose life, to vote for life, and not in any way thinking that the other candidate is a bad person. I pray for all our politicians. I pray for their families. You know, my faith teaches me love and compassion and mercy for everybody, even if people are different from what I think or what I believe. Um, I pray for all those who are running for this election. May God give them, you know, the protection that they need. And I pray for their conversion, everybody. Um, But because I love my people and because I love my country and because I believe the gift of life is worth going to enrich this country, and enhance all the other rights that we want to see in this country. I do vote for life, and I do vote for the right for life. And I will entrust all the needs and intentions of our country, uh, all the people of our beloved nation, especially those who are suffering in any way because of COVID depression, family problems, or addiction, or even confusion and fear for what is coming, um, I will bring all these intentions, every American soul, in my heart, in my prayer, and give them to Our Lady as I make this pilgrimage. 
And with that, I would like to pray in in English, uh, our Father. Um, that's the prayer that our forefathers prayed. And then I will conclude with Hail Mary in Aramaic. In the name of the Father, and Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Shamilach Mariam, Nintewa Shapaka, Marim in the Mendach, Borak to us in Tay, Borshan Terry Cast of Isha, Mat Mariam Yimid Allah, Sani Badanan, Echni Fatai, Hadi of Danit Mountain, Ami. I pray through the intercession of all our American and Black saints and all the many holy men and women of this nation who gave their lives to preserve liberty and gift of life for this land, that they may all be with us, praying with us and for us from heaven to make the choice of truth for this generation and those to come. Amen. Amen. Glory be to the Father into the Son, into the Holy Spirit, Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. God bless you all. Well, Mother Olga, thank you so much for coming on our show, and thank you so much for concluding it in prayer. And tomorrow I'm speaking in Austin, a group about 500 people. I'm going to, in my speech, ask all of them to spend the next three days uh, joining you in, in prayer and, and fasting and acts of penance. And I promise you the Jones family will be doing the same. Thank you, Jason. Mother Teresa always said, together we can do something beautiful for God and for people. And I do believe you're going to help me with this mission. Thank you. Thank you, Mother Olga. Aloha. God bless. God bless. Bye-bye. What a privilege was that? What a pri- I get nervous. I was nervous the whole time because I want to. My whole idea with the podcast is to be a frame. And as a talkative person, it's hard to be the frame. Like the guest is the work of art. My job is to get them, allow them, really, not get in their way, allow them to speak, to share what they believe and they want to communicate as clearly and as beautifully as possible. And I know I have, and I, uh, I often talk over guests. I'm, I'm working on that. But I wanted to be a frame for Mother Olga, and I was so excited to share her with you. And I'm so grateful she prayed for us in Aramaic. I don't know about you, but for me, always, even if you're not a Christian, I think it's pretty neat to hear uh, Christian prayer in the language that Jesus spoke, um, his colloquial language, his day-to-day language. Uh, I think that's that was beautiful. And now, guy, I just want to end it this way. I want everyone listening. And it is my great joy to see how this show is just spreading all over the world. And uh, all sorts of folks are listening. And I think we share a common commitment to the vulnerable. Many of us, because we come from communities that have been ambushed, that have been the victims of history, that are suffering today. And I want to make this promise to you, this commitment, not only through my work with my nonprofit organization and my writing and in my films, you know, which I hope it demonstrates uh, a discipline and a commitment to sharing the interests of the vulnerable, but... Um, I promise you this, when I go in and vote, I'm going to close my eyes and I'm going to think about my ancestors. I'm going to think about them. I'm going to think about my grandfather in World War II in Korea and uh, the horrible violence that he saw standing up to totalitarian socialism in Korea and to national socialism in World War II. I'm going to think about him. I'm going to think about what my son had to, to, to suffer in Syria and Iraq and my brother and my other close friends. I'm going to think of my Christian friends that, in Iraq, and Muslim friends in Iraq who have suffered genocide and saw the shattering of order, the rise of ISIS, and all of that violence. And I'm going to be thinking about the Uyghur. And I I am voting. I am voting so that we have a country that no longer exploits migrants, that we no longer have an economy resting on the exploitation of countless millions of people. I am voting to make sure that this next administration... Um, and you know how I'm voting, our next next, uh, continuation of this administration does everything it needs to do in trade policy, every tool in the kit 
uh, to make sure that those camps are closed in East Turkestan, that the Uyghur are free. I'll be voting for the freedom activists in Hong Kong, the democracy activists in Hong Kong. I'll be voting for the Armenians. I, I, I will be voting, as you know, most especially for the child in the womb. Some of those children, many of them will grow up to wear hats that say, yeah, I'm pro-choice, whatever. I'm going to vote. For, I'm voting for them. I'm voting for their protection. I'm voting that our laws stop lying to young women and telling them that abortion just removes, it's just a grain of sand and a teaspoon of blood. Then they have to spend the rest of their life grappling with the reality of what it really was. I'm going to pray that our laws no longer lie to young women, that no longer abandon the most vulnerable members of our family, the child in the womb, to violence. That's how I will be voting. But I will join Mother Olga in prayer and penance uh, for the next three days. I don't know what penance, what sacrifice I'll, I'll do. I'll have to think about that. I wanted to pick something that is actually a sacrifice. I'll think about that. Maybe I'll, I'll just uh, eat one small meal a day on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. That's probably going to be it. But uh, yeah, so no, I'll be voting. And this has been another episode of the Jason Jones Show brought to you by Movie to Movement, promoting a culture of life, love, and beauty through the power of film. Go check out our new movie, Divided Hearts of America, rocking the nation from The Hollywood Reporter to Newsweek to the front page of Drudge to Fox News. We've been everywhere. Divided Hearts of America It's making some noise. You can see it by going to movie2movement.com and streaming it there. You can click through to the streaming services. It'll be embedded there. Use the code MTM because you're my friend. Tell them you're with the DJ. MTM is the code, and you get 20% off, and then share the film. And while you're there, Movie to Movement has been spending, I have been spending money faster than I have been raising it. And uh, because there's a lot of work to do right now. So make a little donation at movietomovement.com. Watch our film. Until next time, this has been the Jason Jones Show with Mother Olga. Pretty cool. Aloha. This has been the Jason Jones Show. Powered by Mudhouse Media. Oh, 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 oh